So epithelial tissues, the form of the word epithelial is an adjective and it describes the type of tissue. It's always going to be one of the four, epithelial connective muscle or nervous. And sometimes if you see the term epithelium, it's the same thing, right? It's just a different form of the same word. The functions are coverings, linings, and glandular functions. Coverings like skin. Skin is an ep uh, epithelium. What about like on the insides of things too, like the linings? We're going to be looking at the linings of the blood vessels, the, the GI tract, the urinary tract, the respiratory tract. and the reproductive tract. Anything that's a tube in the body, if you cut it, there's a hole in it. Okay? The hole, um, the space you don't call it a hole, you call it a lumen. It's like if you had a piece of paper and you poked holes in it and you held it up to the light and the light shone through the holes. It illuminates through the holes, lumen. So in anatomy you call a hole lumen and the lumen has a lining. So that's what it's for. But we'll look at a lot of that. So coverings and linings have uh, a lot of different functions. But also, the other major function of epithelial tissue is their glands. You can have unicellular glands as well as multicellular glands. The function of glands is secretion. Okay. Well, we'll talk about which ones. Uh, later. But anyways, let's start off with the, how you classify the epithelia because they're like many different kinds. And the classification, you have some pictures in the book. The classification of epithelia is based on the arrangement of the cells. As you can see, these illustrations, it's a cell packed tissue, which is kind of like the hallmark of it. That makes this uh, kind of tissue good for being linings and membranes and also as glandular. There's no fibers. Usually for tissues you, th you think of the fibers that make up the tissue. Um, the epithelium, there, there's no room for it. All the cells are packed tightly together and they're arranged in different ways. <laughs> So classification. <coughs> so look, look all, mm, be pay close attention to how I spell the words. I said epithelia. Now in anatomy. If an A is at the end of the word, that pluralizes it. That means many different kinds. What's the singular form of the word? You already wrote it down. With the U-M. With the U-M, yeah. 
Um, okay. So you can classify based on arrangement. Like if there's one layer of cells, they call that a uh, symbol. Call this number one by arrangement. So this is one row of cells. So imagine you have a, a single row of cells there. So red is like the cell membrane. How about I use green for the, the nucleus? If you have uh, many layers, they, they call that a stratified. So you have a few layers of flat cells. But then maybe you have a, a few more layers of cells underneath that. And usually if that occurs, the bottom layers are not flattened cells. They're more cuboidal and roundish. <coughs> There's also an arrangement called pseudostratified. It's not shown on the slide. If simple is one layer and stratified is many layers, pseudostratified is one layer, but it has the appearance of stratified. It looks like it's many layers, but really it's one layer. It looks something like uh, In histology, a lot of times the, the nucleus is a clue. If I see one row of nuclei, I, I think one layer. But if I see like many nuclei like stacked on top of one another, I think stratified. And that's what I see here. I see, oh, it looks like there's many nuclei. It looks like there's more than one layer. But what's difficult to see is that every cell is touching the bottom. And what I should say is that there's a foundation for all epithelia. They always lie on a connective tissue um, layer called the basement membrane. There's a bunch of uh, collagen fibers here. Basement membrane. Always draw it underneath every epithelium. I'll draw it under here too. So again, this type of tissue is called pseudostratified. <coughs> Let me write it all out. I don't, I don't want to hyphenate this. You can also classify the epithelia by the shape, the shape of the cell, look at the bottom of the picture there.
Squamous means flat. That's one type of epithelial cell. And I kind of put it right next to this, this here. It would be simple squamous because it's one layer of flat cells. These cells are also flat. And you would call it a stratified squamous. I realize that the cells I drew under it are not squamous, but you only consider the apical layers. So you would call this second one not simple squamous, but stratified squamous. Okay. You have other shapes of cells. Um, cells can be shaped like columns with these large oval cigar shaped nuclei. We call that columnar shaped cells. What I drew just above it is an example of a pseudostratified columnar epithelium. You usually see that a lot for the pseudostratified. There's always pseudostratified columnar somewhere that we study. Then you have a shape in between a column and a flat cell. It's more like a cube shape. So it's kind of more square, not columnar. And columnar cells have cigar shaped nuke, but cuboidal cells have large round nukes, usually like that. Cuboidal. <coughs> so, in terms of shape, we have, let's check it off, we have flat, squamous, that's one. Columnar, that's two. Cuboidal, that's three. And there's a fourth type that's kind of an exception. It's called a transitional epithelium. Transitional epithelium, they're kind of like stretchy. You could stretch them out, like the inside of your bladder. When your bladder is empty, it's not stretched, but as it fills with a liter of urine, you stretch out that epithelium. So this epithelium has the ability to be stretched. If it's not stretched out, the apical cells, they, they look kind of domey. It's not an anatomy word, but kind of domey. They're not flattened. And a lot of times the nuclei are large and round. And you even see this like binucleated cell at the top. <coughs> None of the cells are squamous, they're all kind of like I'm drawing here. So what I drew, is it simple or stratified? Is it one layer or many layers? Many layers. So we call that what again? Stratified. It is stratified. We don't call it that. They call this transitional. Let me write that on the board. 
like I said, is an exception. Why do we call it transitional? Because histologists thought this tissue was some kind of transition between cuboidal and columnar. So the name kind of stuck. So you could just call this transitional epithelium. This is the only example we'll find in the urinary bladder. That's the location of it. So let's say that the bladder fills with urine and you stretch that tissue out. It kind of flattens a little bit as you stretch out the bladder wall. So it stretched, it may look like kind of more flattened out because you're stretching it. empty bladder and uh, say this is full bladder or I'm sorry this is empty that's full I'm get the pictures mixed up sorry about that full empty <coughs> there's a word in physiology that's used a lot um, distend that means stretch it out I use that word a lot because I see it all the time well, anyways, does that make sense why I drew it like this? Why a full bladder looks like that? Because you stretch out the whole bladder wall. I'm not drawing the whole bladder, right? I'm just drawing a piece of the wall. Uh, let's pull you well, anyways, okay, so we categorize by, uh, um, you know, arrangement, by shape. Also, we categorize based on the surface modifications. It's like a third category. One is by arrangement, two is by shape, three is by surface modification. And we put it all together. So call this number three, surface modification. There's different ways you can modify a surface of an epithelium. It could be ciliated. There could be a microvilli brush border. Um, there could be goblet cells stuck in between, which are mucus cells. It could be keratinized for waterproofing. Keratinizing. Usually, we see a ciliated epithelium be one that is also pseudostratified and columnar. So, let me kind of draw it. Pseudostratified, columnar, columnar cells, but they appear to be stratified when they're not. We just call it pseudostratified. Let me draw that again. So there's my pseudostratified columnar epithelium on my basement <laughs> membrane. If it's ciliated, which they usually are, in fact, they always are as far as I'm concerned, they, they got this, I'm drawing it as blue hair, but the cilia, they, they have this beating motion at the surface. Okay. 
And I usually also see goblet cells in there. So I'm going to squeeze a goblet cell right here. Some mucus secreting cells. And they're stuck in between the epithelial cells. So I'll keep drawing more epithelial cells around it. The goblet cell's job is to secrete mucus onto the surface of the epithelium to make it moist. And we see this in the trachea. So secrete mucus layer on top. That's kind of their function. This big mucus membrane is called, I'll, I'll give the full name. You will call it a ciliated, pseudostratified, columnar, epithelial tissue, and I'll use the abbreviation ET for that, so I'm running out of room here, with goblet cells. So do you see how we do that? We, we list the surface modification first. You don't have to, but I, I tend to do that. I tend to see that. Then you put the kind of arrangement, it's pseudostratified and in the shape, columnar, and it always goes in that order. Never reverse it. it it's always pseudostratified, then columnar. Simple cuboidal, okay, it's always that order. And then epithelial tissue, the ET. And then I put another surface modification at the end with the goblet cells. Okay, and if this were a quiz, I would expect to see everything for full credit. So those are, and it, an example of one tissue type that has two of the surface modifications, this one and that one, right? You see this kind of tissue in the trachea? We call that the location. Let me give you an example of the other two, the microvilli brush border. We usually see that in the small intestines for cells that uh, require a lot of absorption. I'm going to draw a simple columnar epithelium. my columnar cells with large nuclei. And I'm going to draw like a little brush border here at the top of these cells. And I'm still going to draw my basement membrane underneath. And the microvilli brush border is a little, it looks like a little brush border. What's really happening there is the top of the cell membrane is all curvy. And I think I mentioned this before in a previous lecture. If you can really look at it, it's, what you're doing is the microvilli, villi means finger shape. Okay. So the microvilli is a folding of the plasma membrane to increase the sort the absorptive surface area. Folding of cell membrane. <coughs> increases surface area. So again, to, to formally name this tissue, it's a simple columnar epithelial tissue you know, with a microvilli brush border.
with microvilli breast board. So in naming tissues, if you see it, you have to name it, okay? Obviously, that's why I'm presenting them to you. All right, the last one is a keratinizing uh, modification. We see that on skin, okay? This one, we see lining the surfaces of the GI tract. So let's say small intestine as an example location for this tissue type. So location, small intestine. Makes sense, right? You gotta absorb all the food you ate, so you want more of a surface area on the lining of the lumen of your intestines. So you might like to be like brush border keratinizing. So this time I'll name it, then I'll draw it. Where we see a keratinizing epithelium is the skin, and so technically in this chapter we call skin a keratinizing stratified squamous epithelium. Skin. Keratinizing. Stratified. Squamous epithelial tissue. This time I, I wrote it out. You know, on a quiz, if you use the abbreviation ET, uh, that's okay, but I would write it out a couple times just so I know you know how to spell it. If you put ET every time, I'm going to mark it wrong every time. So you better like do me a favor, just spell, write it out a little bit. I gotta know that you know how to spell these things. Okay, well, let's draw it. So I'm drawing the character on top, orange wavy lines, and I'll draw a bunch of, uh, well it's stratified squamous, so my apical layers are going to be like flat. I've been using blue. What's my blue on the bottom there? Basement membrane, always on the bottom. But this on the top was the keratinizer, just to be clear. The function of it is waterproofing. Skin is basically waterproof. And when we talk about skin, we have a whole chapter on integument. This is basically, you know, the epidermis of skin. And, well, the, the cells on the bottom, they're like the younger cells. They're rapidly undergoing mitosis. And they kind of get pushed to the top. And as they get pushed to the top, they get flattened, and eventually they die. And so um, keratin is basically a bunch of dead skin cells that have been, become fully keratinized. And they're, and they're really good for waterproofing skin. Okay, I, I want to move on. Let me get past that.
from sliding. Let's talk about other features of epithelium besides how we classify them. Um, so I say polarized, avascular, regenerative, just to remind me those are the characteristics I want you to know. Characteristics of the epithelia. So I say apical basal surfaces. So what I've been drawn is you have your cells and they're on top of the basement membrane. The side of the cell that is on the basement membrane basal surface. And the side opposite is the apical surface. That's what they're showing you on this picture. Um, now, because you have that arrangement, these two sides, bottom, top and bottom basically, the organelles inside um, are are usually polarized one way or the, the other. Maybe you have the nuclei on the bottom, that's usually what I see, and there's probably other cell organelles at the top. Maybe the ER Golgi is on top and... Well, anyways, cells are polarized. You don't have a random arrangement of cell organelles, so that's what polarity means. All right, cell organelles are polarized. <coughs> so here's a picture of um, a stratified squamous epithelium. Okay. And so let me um, point out to you why it's stratified and squamous. When you name um, the epithelium, consider only the apical layers. See these top layers? They're stratified. These are not stratified. What would you call from here to here? This is the basement membrane. I've been drawing as a blue line. <laughs> It's not very accurate, is it? This is really what it looks like. But this is a stratified epithelium all the way from top to bottom. This is basically um, a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. You don't have to put non-keratinized. If it's not there, you don't have to put that it's not there, essentially. Some people do, okay? But if you see keratin, you have to put it, but there's no keratin on top of here. And the point of me showing you this is there's no room for fibers or blood vessels or anything else. So that's what avascular means. Epithelial tissues have no room for blood vessels. Let's write that. They're avascular. Blood vessels have to go up to the bottom, if that makes sense. You have to send a little blood vessel up. It has to end there. Maybe you could have capillary exchange uh, here, and gas exchange, and then can only go up to the bottom, right? Up to the basement membrane there. So, because they're avascular, there's no room for blood vessels. Nourishment is by diffusion. I had on that slide is that they're regenerative. It's another characteristic of this tissue type. Um, some tissues don't regenerate well. 
Okay, they're amitotic, but epithelial tissue are highly regenerative. Okay, so in a, a stratified epithelium, let's say the, the bottom cells lower down, not on the apical surface, they rapidly undergo mitosis. to replace uh, top cells. There's a word uh, called um, desquamation. D means just take off the top layers. So, so when you desquamate, the top flat layers are getting rubbed off on a regular basis, and they're continually replaced by the bottom layers, which are undergoing rapid mitosis. Okay. <coughs> so um, this really protects against abrasion, because you can like, just keep rubbing off the top layers, and the bottom layers can't protect it. Let's look at an example of an epithelium being damaged in the, in the full process of regeneration, shown here. Okay, so we call this the, the wound healing figure. Wound healing. Let's read what the slide says and I'll paraphrase for you. Inflammation sets the stage and it lists some details. You got bleeding by some blood vessels, you have inflammatory chemicals released. Local blood vessels become more permeable, allowing white blood cells, fluid clotting proteins, and other plasma proteins to seep into the injured area. And then clotting occurs, form, forming a scab. So initially, Keyword is inflammation. You know the redness and swelling when you get a cut. So I'm writing that the wound bleeds. Also, I'm going to write the damaged tissue cells release these. Um, they're, they're blue dots here. They call them inflammatory chemicals. Damaged tissue cells release inflammatory chemicals. What inflammatory chemicals do, I wish they would say this on their slide, they, uh, they attract white blood cells to the area that has been wounded or infected. Okay. Inflammatory chemicals attract white blood cells. That's what you see pictured here because all of these white blood cells, they're leaving the bloodstream. They're literally jumping across the cell wall and they're venturing into the skin to help fight infection if there is an infection. Okay, well the next step <coughs> is organization restores the blood supply. 
The clot is replaced by granulation, granulation tissue, which restores vascular uh, supply. Fibroblasts produce collagen fibers that bridge the gap. Macrophages phagocytize dead and dying cells and other debris, and surface epithelial cells multiply, migrate over the granulation tissue. Okay. So step two, restore blood supply. Oh, by the way, if you don't do that, the tissue dies. And that's called necrosis, which is death of tissue. But we're pretending like that doesn't happen. So when you restore the blood supply, you replace the clot, which is a temporary seal, with scar tissue. Okay. Clot replaced by granulation tissue. I usually just call it scar tissue. But um, also what's happening is the white blood cells like macrophages, and they show neutrophils here too, they're keeping the area sterile. Or they're, they're phagocytizing uh, dead and dying cells, other debris. So I'll just say WBCs, white blood cells, keep wounded area sterile. Okay, so you got that granulation tissue. The last step is regeneration and fibrosis affect permanent repair. The fibrosed area matures and contracts. The epithelium uh, thickens and a fully regenerated epithelium with an underlying scar uh, area below is what results there. All right, so by the time we get to step three, I'm just going to call it regeneration. By this time, the epithelium is fully regenerative. fully regenerated. It overlies the scar tissue. It's important to note that the fibrosed area contracts to draw the wounded tissue together. Okay. tissue contracts bringing wounded tissues together <coughs> so that's what sutures do you bring the, the cut tissues together and allow them to uh, heal. So that process is called wound healing. You know, the next slides, I actually taught them as part of the cell chapter, intercellular connections. I'm just going to, I'm not going to reteach them. I'll just say in your notes, go ahead and review it if you have to, these tight junctions.
the desmosomes. as well as the um, gap junctions. So you, you still got to know, it's just they've already been presented. All right, well, uh, I want to talk about seven epithelial tissues that um, I teach in this unit. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll go in order, okay? So I tell you how they're classified, so those seven types should make sense. And, but now we'll kind of look at examples of them and be more thorough about their locations and functions. We'll start with examples of simple squamous epithelial tissues. So, the three examples are endothelium, mesothelium, and air sacs. So, whenever you have a simple squamous ET, you want to think about the, the function. It's only one layer. So, that makes it a good spot to have things diffuse across. Okay, so generally speaking, that's the function of a simple squamous epithelial tissue. Fn is my shorthand for function, um, basically. I say absorption and diffusion, pretty much just diffusion. Things can cross your barrier because there's only one cell thickness. It's easy to get across. Okay. So there's two cells together there, and I'm just kind of it's easy to go straight across if you're a molecule. Now the examples we have are endothelium, I'll show you a picture of that. You'll learn um, blood vessel structure in 431, but basically what you see there, the endothelium is a simple squamous <coughs> epithelium that's the innermost lining of blood vessels. So what you have is more or less a continuous layer of flat cells. And blood flows across it. I mean, the picture in the slide is better. It shows you the simple squamous epithelium right here. See all those layers, how all those cells are put together continuously? You have many layers outside of it, external to it. Those are called the tunics. The tunica intima is the innermost layer. Okay, so that, that includes uh, the endothelium there. So I'm going I'm to note that on the board here that the endothelium is part of what's called tunica intima. A part of tunica intima. Think of um, the biggest blood vessels, the thickest ones, as having three layers or tunics. This is just one of them. And it's the innermost one you'll see the other But anyways, this is an example of a simple squamous epithelial tissue. Here's a, a, a micrograph of um, a blood vessel. I'm going to turn the lights off. Maybe you can see the image a little better. 
I'm pointing to it with the red arrow. And what you see in the lumen are black red blood cells flowing through. This particular blood vessel is a very small one, and it's reduced down to one layer, the tunic and intima. And I'm pointing to that single layer of cells in the simple squamous epithelium. Okay, so that's a nice picture of it. Another example of a simple squamous epithelium is called the mesothelium. Mesothelium is a serous membrane. Now, membrane is a word that's used in anatomy as a particular meaning. A membrane is an epithelium with a connective tissue basement membrane underneath. That's it. So I'm going to draw a flat layer of cells, because it's a simple squamous ET. I'm going to draw my connective tissue basement membrane underneath. So this epithelium happens to have a secretion That secretion, I'm using green, which is an odd color, but um, it's called a transduit to make it moist. Transduit. And where you find these are the linings of your body cavity. And to show a picture of it, so the location. The lining of your body cavity is called the peritoneum. That's where you see it. You see it lining the surfaces of your heart, called the pericardium. It surrounds the heart. You see it surrounding the lungs, which is called the pleura. So this is what we have, what we call the three P's in anatomy. The peritoneum, the, the pericardium, and the pleura, they're all lined with the mesothelium, it's a serous membrane. So uh, the picture is pretty good. I'm turning the lights off here. When you look at it overhead, it looks like a cobblestone street. Well, here's a picture I took. It's one layer, and all the cells are cobbled together. Okay, that's what it looks like. That's a mesothelium. Okay. It's not an endothelium, it's a mesothelium, but we, you call them both simple squamous ET. All right, here's an example of simple squamous epithelium in the lung. called alveolar sacs. Usually uh, I draw an alveolar sac as a little tube with a little flask on the bottom there. It's literally a sac. It's a tiny sac that you bring fresh air into. Fresh air. So 
they have oxygen for gas exchange, but anyways, the sac is lined with the simple squamous epithelium. If I can draw kind of like um, Okay, so that's kind of what you're seeing there in the picture of the air sacs, right? The alveolar spaces. Simple squamous E T. Now here's a picture of it from our slides. When you see these pictures that aren't from the book, I took them. And uh, usually what I do for lab, I won't do it today, but I'll, I'll get our slides and I'll take pictures of them <coughs> because I want you to like know what our slides look like because that's what I quiz you on, right? I don't quiz you on pictures from the internet. I'm very old school. I like to test you on what's in our lab because this is your lab. Right, not the internet. This is your lab. So I test you on what we have. That's why I, I encourage you for this chapter to use our scopes and to use our slides because that's what I'm testing you on. Okay, you can go and look up pictures on the internet. That's great. But when you're here, you study what we have. That's kind of where I come down. This is what we have. If I say identify tissue, say simple squamous epithelium. If I say, well, what organ is it located? What do you say? Long. Yeah, easy. All right, moving on. Simple cuboidal, so what that looks like. Simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. Um, a good, good example is kidney. Kidney. <coughs> to be specific, kidney tubules. Understand that the kidney is a filter organ. There's the glomerular capillaries that filter all your blood plasma. And all that filtrate, the filtered blood plasma, has to be processed by the kidney tubules. And you always want to absorb all the nutrients that you want to conserve and you don't want to lose it to the urine. Well, anyways, you'll, you'll learn that physiology uh, next semester. But in terms of looking at the kidney tubules, they look like these uh, wagging wheels. These big tubes shaped like a wheel. You got these cuboidal cells arranged in a circle with large round nuclei. membrane around that. Okay. So that's a simple cuboidal ET. Okay. That's if you cut a tube in a cross section. It looks like that. You could cut a tube longitudinally. Okay, so you may get this look. membrane is on either side. Up here. 
it's still simple squamous, right? There's my basement membrane, there's my one layer. So what am I pointing at now? What do we call it? What's the L word for hole? Lumen. That's the lumen there. That's the lumen there. Depending on how you cut the tube. If you just look at that picture, I mean, you don't know what you're looking at. It looks like a stratified epithelium to me. But if based on what I just told you, you know what to look for. It's simple. Here, here, here's one cut tube. It's a simple squamous ET. Here's one cut tube. It's more or less cut longitudinally. But it's, but it's all simple squamous ET. There's no stratification here. Yeah, that's in the kidney. There's a picture I took. What's the space called again? The lumen. This one was cut longitudinally. So here's my simple squamous, no, excuse me, simple cuboidal ET, sorry. You know, there and there. You see my wagon wheel there? Something you see a lot in the kidney is that the simple cuboidal ET has a brush border, a microvilli brush border. See how it looks all kind of like fuzzy? If you see that, you would have to put with microvilli brush border. So let me add that to your kidney. You always see it. Not always, but it's there. 